We think of history as a series of actions deemed important enough to put into writing. On the surface, this makes sense. Most of history took place when few people could read or write, so if something was recorded, it was probably important. Fortunately, this means we have a good idea of the big picture stuff. International trade, the battles and wars, the emperors and their empires. But a sad consequence of this approach is that the little details of human lives largely disappear. Minutia that reveal the complexity in all of us and draw a through line from past to present mostly end up lost to time because nobody bothered writing them down, or so the story goes. You can't blame people for believing that anything we didn't lose, anything that made it through the great filter of human history, must be meaningful, if only by process of elimination. It's a nice thought, but kind of naive. It places humans at the center of the universe and assumes everything moves around us by the hand of fate. It ignores that many histories have been erased on purpose, not by the simple passage of time. This understanding of history as whatever records survive fails us now more than ever in the 21st century because in the information age, we have records of almost everything, but most of it is entirely worthless. Every thought I've expressed on YouTube, Twitter, or Facebook lives on in the cloud long after its deletion. Every ad I've opened on every device I've ever owned, every website I've visited, every person I've ever messaged, and everyone they've visited, thoroughly documented. Information you or I have no use for, but that is very handy for advertisers. You can actually request a report on all this info from Google. Mine takes up a little over 10 gigabytes. And setting aside the data harvesting, the internet is inconceivably massive. The Wayback Machine is a service that archives web pages. It currently has 514 billion pages archived. How many of them are valuable? We literally can't know. In the time it takes to read a single page, a quarter million more get added. So we find ourselves once again at odds with history, but for the opposite reason as before. So much of our times get recorded that we can't hope to filter through and keep track of everything valuable. Inevitably, almost all of the internet will fade into obscurity, never to be read or referenced again. No corner of the internet exemplifies this better than Mogai. Thousands of blogs, HTML'd with care and updated diligently, then left to gather dust. Tens of millions of posts outlining bright new ideas that surely felt vital to their authors, never spoken of or even thought of again. If any corner of the modern internet will be lost, it'll probably be ones like this, abandoned even as they were being created. I think that's a real shame. I'm here to make the case that this online movement, known mainly as a laughing stock, deserves a critical second look. It might not look the part, but I think Mogai stands to teach us a lot about how queer people find each other, how young people interact differently with culture, how online communities form and thrive and then parasitize one another. To let it fade into that era 404, domain expired, good night, would be a waste. So let's talk about Mogai. Mogai is a social movement that originated on Tumblr around 2013 or so. Its name stands for Marginalized Orientations, Gender Alignments, and Intersex. If you think that sounds like the same thing as LGBT+, you're not wrong. The Mogai scene emerged as a response to a perceived problem that, try as we might, the LGBT community can never be perfectly inclusive because there's only so many letters you can fit in the acronym. The idea is that having only lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender in the name implicitly devalues anyone included in the plus, non-binary, pansexual, and so on. But since adding a new letter for every single identity becomes untenable very quickly, a truly inclusive community should do away with the acronym altogether. Marginalized orientations, gender alignments, and intersex intentionally casts a very wide net without centering any one group. Right from the start, the movement was very heavily focused on language. And while they took it a lot further than most, it's not actually exceptional that a queer community would form around shared language. Let's take a look back in time, learn how things were before the cursed internet came into play. 
Historically, labels often become popular when they describe a group's lived experience better than the existing language. Often, a label is adopted when a group of people recognize what they have in common and aim to organize around it. The word bisexual is a great modern example. Up until the 1970s, what we now know as the LGBT community was mainly called the gay and lesbian community because language and activism around gay men and lesbians was the most developed. That doesn't mean there weren't bisexuals or trans people in the gay community. There were, many of whom were very influential, but no label to describe them was commonplace yet. But while bisexuals and gays share lots of common ground, being bisexual also comes with unique experiences and challenges. It became clear that closing that lexical gap and affirming bisexuality as its own orientation would make it easier to tackle the issues bisexuals face. When the label bisexual picked up steam in the 70s, there was an explosion of bisexual advocacy, a swell of grassroots support, and tons of people very quickly began announcing themselves as bisexual to the world. Even some famous men who did like really awful things to women. That's cool. The newly organized bisexual community made it easier than ever for people with shared struggles to find each other and work together for a better future. Shared language and self-image are a great foundation to build a community on. So it's really no wonder that Mogai did the same. But where labels like bisexual, lesbian, or non-binary describe the way a group of people already relates to the world, Mogai seemed to take it in the opposite direction, instead describing ways one could theoretically, I guess, relate to the world, whether or not anyone actually did. Where for the early bisexual community, language was the first step to achieving their goals, it seems that in the Mogai community, language was the goal. A vocabulary for every possible experience of the self or the world, real or not, marginalized or not. In pursuit of this goal, new gender and sexuality labels are coined online every single day, but basically none of them ever see widespread use. Most fizzle out just as they're being born, never being of much help to anyone. Since anyone can coin one of these new labels, we'll never know how many there are, but it's not for lack of trying. A handful of blogs maintain glossaries of all the terms they've come across. I figured if a new term found its way into one of these glossaries, it was probably known enough to see at least some level of use and potentially fill some important lexical gap. To test my theory, I downloaded one of these glossaries off Tumblr. Originally, I wanted to scan through the whole thing, but I quickly realized it is 72 freaking pages long, so I resigned myself to the first 400 terms. I looked each one of them up on Google and Tumblr to see how many had been used at least once following their coinage. There's some degree of subjectivity in deciding what counts as a term getting used. I didn't count posts where someone created a pride flag for a new identity, since practically every new identity has one, even the ones that never get used. There are also these posts that list dozens of obscure identities and name them all as valid. This isn't a discussion of them by any means, and I doubt the authors of these posts could even define all of them, so I'm not counting these either. Other than that, I was pretty permissive with my methodology. If anyone had made fan art about a label or its flag, I counted the label as being used. If someone created a headcanon of a fictional character that included a label, I counted that too. Hell, if I could even find one person identifying with a given label, I counted it. I wasn't looking to see how many of the 400 words had caught on in the mainstream, it was quickly clear that none had, but instead how many were used in a way that made me think they were useful, even a little bit, even to one person. Once I had finished, here's what I found. Of the 400 terms I looked at, only 130 had been used following their coinage, or about 32%. That's more than two-thirds of these supposedly necessary labels that not a single person ever discussed or publicly identified with. You have to wonder how useful a label is if even its creator never once speaks of it again. So, why did so many terms in the Mogai community fizzle out? Well, I noticed a couple trends that could explain this. First off, a lot of labels are described in super abstract ways that make them almost impossible to nail down. For example, koi gender is defined as a gender that feels as if it is on mute. What does that mean exactly? How do I know if that describes me? I have a million ideas for what a muted gender could be, 
and it's potentially interesting, but if a person sees this in their feed, they're not going to know whether it describes them or not. I also noticed that over the years, multiple labels have been coined to describe the exact same thing. Since a new Mogai label very rarely picks up steam, nobody learns it and it dies out. Then somewhere down the line, someone is looking to describe the same feeling and they coin a new term since they don't know the existing one. That one dies out too, rinse, wash, repeat. It's unfortunate because it means that potentially useful ideas, the ones described independently by tons of different people, become fragmented beyond repair. When someone goes searching for a label to describe themselves, they sometimes find three or four words that mean the exact same thing, which is just confusing and kills any chance of a coherent community coming together. And even more confusing, I found Mogai labels that mean the same thing as words we already had. The word com gender is described as something that possesses a gender, so the opposite of agender. But we already had a word for that. It's gendered. It's not a new word. And to my eye, the terms Malloy, word gender, and min gender all just mean male or male aligned with no asterisk. Perfect synonyms for well-established language. Why they thought it necessary to do this, your guess is as good as mine. It's normal for online communities to be decentralized, but rarely have I come across one that's so disorganized. The whole community was built on validating every member's thoughts and feelings equally, so they wound up with no common goals, no standards across the board. Basically, anything is valid, anything goes. On the surface, that sounds egalitarian, welcoming, but I wonder if that kind of environment can't come with a certain risk. To reiterate the usefulness of labels, they serve as assertions of your identity. When I call myself a lesbian, I'm saying I don't have to date men to have value. When I call myself a trans woman, I'm saying it's possible for me to be a woman despite having been assigned male at birth. And as we know, Mogai has words for practically every conceivable experience of gender or sexuality. Is it possible then that labeling everything also tacitly validates everything? I'm not saying we should tell people their genders are stupid and fake. What I am saying is that growing up queer or trans entails a lot of confusion, repression, denial. Digging through all that to unearth your true feelings is a journey that often takes years. I know mine did. It's only natural that when you're beginning to question your gender or your sexuality for the first time, what you're feeling often isn't quite right because you're missing information. You've just started learning about yourself. I think giving a name to a feeling someone has at the very beginning of that journey is risky. Let's take, for example, this Tumblr post dated to October 2017. I am AFAB and I definitely feel like my gender is female, but I don't think I'm cis. I feel dysphoria like I'm supposed to have an AMAB body, yet I want to present as a female. What is this? Here we see an anonymous user express what I think is pretty clear gender dysphoria cloaked beneath a couple layers of confusion. And when you're just starting to figure yourself out, it's normal for your feelings to contradict like this. And this post could be a jumping off point for tons of good questions to help this person figure themselves out. What about my current body is bothering me? Or what appeals to me about having a male body? But the blogger doesn't encourage Anon to ask these questions, or any other questions for that matter. Instead, they tell Anon that it's problematic to desire an AMAB body, and then offer 14 different gender labels as alternatives. Most of these gender labels are vague and basically describe an experience of gender that's confusing or contradictory. And I'm just wondering, who does this help? To slap a label on your confusion and resolve not to dig deeper. For a community that supposedly values self-discovery, Mogai strikes me as uniquely incurious about what lies beneath. I find this post especially troubling because years ago, this easily could have been me. I spent months thinking that I didn't deserve to be a girl, trying to settle somewhere in the middle even though I knew it wasn't quite right. Accepting yourself as trans is complicated and lengthy and terrifying. It can upend your whole life. But I mean, I also think it's worth it. So I'm glad no one validated the dread I felt in those early stages. If someone had told me back then, oh, well you're kind of a boy but kind of miserable as a boy, um, you're just scoliogender. 
I might have believed them. It could have led me down entirely the wrong path. And this isn't a question of like binary trans people versus non-binary people. This approach hurts people of all genders because it encourages us to stick a name on our confusion instead of trying to work through it. I found tons of other terms like this. Coexta, a person who has an inconsistent relationship with gender and can't describe their gender. Blurry fluid, a gender that is so vague you can't figure it out. Shell gender, a gender that is hollow and unfelt. I think if a gender is hollow and unfelt to you, it's probably just not your gender. And that's fine, you're allowed. Each and every one of these is a valid experience of gender, but none of them are in themselves a gender. I think they're just different ways to say you're working through your shit and you're looking for language to describe yourself. And since the internet loves assuming the worst of binary trans women, <laughs> you see my hair, come on. I wanna be really clear here. I think people who describe themselves this way are telling the truth about themselves, or at least trying to. This isn't a question of people clinging on to queer labels for attention or to be trendy. I think it's just people looking to understand themselves, maybe for the first time in their lives. I think there's another reason such hyper-specific labeling often fails. It assumes it's possible to break ourselves down into clearly delineated and infinitely specific categories in a way that just doesn't work offline. Take, for instance, the term juxera, a gender that is strongly connected to femininity, but in a different way than women are connected to femininity. This identity implies that women are connected to femininity in one singular way that's essential to womanhood, but I don't think that exists. Being a woman means hundreds of different things depending who you ask, and two people can be women without having a single thing in common. I feel like I'm hitting a wall. Honestly, I may be asking the wrong questions here. Sure, their framework doesn't hold up in real life, but is it even trying to? Maybe not. The Mogai world is largely disinterested with meat space because of most of the Mogai community doesn't navigate queer life offline. And that's for one very good reason. The Mogai community always skewed very young. I spoke to a friend who told me she got involved at age 12, and honestly I think that's pretty average, I'm sure some got in even younger. Mogai was a movement composed mostly of teenagers, and it's not hard to tell. What can its demographics tell us about the community's structure and its goals though? First off, I think it explains the heavy emphasis on validation. Most young queer people have yet to deal with structural oppression like housing and employment discrimination, but chances are they have dealt with invalidation and shame on a personal level. Invalidation starts early in life and it's easier to spot than the structural stuff, so it forms many young people's conception of what discrimination is. I think that's why so much Mogai discourse is about how identities are valid and not about the various challenges of actually living with those identities. Most people in the Mogai world have relatively little lived experience as openly queer. This also reflects in the endless churning of the discourse machine, constant infighting about issues that seem simple on paper or in posts. The same arguments happen over and over. Are asexuals part of the community? Who gets to call themselves a lesbian? No progress is ever made, no consensus ever reached. Spending time in offline communities, especially among people who came out years or decades before you, you realize these issues are much more nuanced than you thought. Well, that or you realize they don't matter at all. With lived experience comes the lesson that life is frequently complicated and tough to pin down. But for many young people, pinning yourself down is a necessary first step just to get a handle on your feelings. It's unsurprising, then, that the Mogai world widely understands gender and sexuality as innate and essential to a person's being as opposed to social or performative. I forgot to finish this thought, so I'll do it now. Since gender is understood as innate, any questioning of someone's gender label is seen as an attack on their very selves. I think that's why it's so gauche to criticize Mogai labels, even the ones that don't make much sense. Of course you're not going to think gender is performative if you haven't had the chance to perform your own gender yet. I mean, I had to accept that I was a woman well before I started doing womanhood every day. That moment of contradiction is a necessary first step. And we need spaces like this for figuring out your gender abstractly before you go forth and embody it. I think it's inevitable that spaces like these will be a little immaterial sometimes. Hopefully I've established that the Mogai movement was led by confused young people 
looking to understand themselves in a way that felt easily conceivable and safe, if extremely online. They focused less on material gains or legibility to a non-queer public, and more on creating a validating community for themselves. The question that arises then is, why was everyone so angry at them? Uh, so today we're gonna be taking to Tumblr, and we're gonna be exploring the world of lots of cool genders that I'm sure all of us will never fucking identify as because we're not crazy people. Never heard of Mogai, you're in for a fucking treat. So today we are reacting to cringy trans TikToks. Now I just downloaded TikTok. There's a lot of cringe on this app, specifically LGBT trans cringe. Like it's on a whole other level. We should acknowledge the elephant in the room here. Mogai inspired cringe content is and always has been bigger than the Mogai movement itself. In fact, without cringe content coming to the forefront this decade, I think Mogai would have lived and died in obscurity. But instead, thanks to a new generation of YouTube grifters, it is now socially acceptable to point and laugh whenever a young person is proudly queer online. Which is really just great. The shit is everywhere. If you're not familiar with anti-trans cringe, keep it that way. You will watch it and leave a less compassionate person. Instead, let me give you the rundown. We start with some queer person who's usually young, passionately expressing themselves, taking up space. Well, I am 100% man, and this man has got something to say to you. If they're embarrassing, it's in the same way as old Facebook statuses from high school. Very sincere, not so self-aware, ultimately kind of endearing. These moments are common in early transition regardless of age. They call it second puberty for a reason. Once we've seen enough, the host, who is most likely also trans, will rip in claiming people like this are what's wrong with the queer community. You literally are making real trans people and real fucking gay people, real queer people in general, look fucking nuts. You Mogai motherfuckers are fucking weird. Conveniently ignoring the fact that people like this are young and without any power to speak of. No discourse on this post, please. I'm minor and panic easily. And then don't say stupid shit online. They'll argue that vocally trans people who reject assimilation are making us normal trans people look bad. How did they make us look bad? Well, the host theorizes that these people are acting out for attention. They don't feel dysphoria, but they want to be included in the trans community and they want all the, you know, attention and what they perceive as the positive things out of being part of the community. That some of them want to be trans because it's trendy or because it's a sexual fantasy of theirs. That's a fetish. That's a fetish. These videos exist to conceive of an other. The trans people unwilling or unable to conform to gender roles, those deemed too unsightly to deserve respect or healthcare. These arguments are not good faith, and their goal isn't to improve the LGBT community. If it was, you would see a lot more videos like the one you're watching right now, trying to understand where the other side is coming from, maybe push back on their faulty reasoning. Nobody has made that video yet, which is why I'm here today. But no. Instead, they work in pursuit of some assimilationist pipe dream, trying to win acceptance for some trans people by disavowing the rest of us. Is this what LGBT is to the rest of the world? I feel like I'm looking at this through the eyes of like general society and how they view all of us. Yeah, no wonder why everyone thinks we're f***ing annoying. This is nothing new. We've been hearing these arguments for at least the last 40 years. Anti-Mogai cringe content is just the latest repackaging of LGBT respectability politics. The acceptably trans us versus the disgusting, unworthy them is an easily digestible narrative. It allows the cis viewer to accept some trans people and feel good about that without challenging any of their baseline ideas on gender. After all, these YouTubers argue that being trans is a medical condition to be cured, not accommodated. It gives the viewer permission to make fun of queer people without shame which is apparently something a lot of people still want to do, which is great. This anti-PC veneer has helped respectability politics spread far and wide, to the point where anti-Mogai content is basically Mogai's entire legacy. If your average person knows anything about, say, neo-pronouns, 
it's almost certainly what they heard from Calvin Guerra or someone like him. If anything in this video has stakes, it's these grifters and their constant pushing of transmedicalism. The idea that every trans person has gender dysphoria, that gender dysphoria is a mental illness, and that any person who claims to be trans without it is either lying or delusional. Transmedicalism isn't one of those frivolous online discourse terms, it predates social media and has very real consequences. Its ends are to demonize non-binary people and anyone who doesn't take hormones, to make medical transition much more difficult, and to make social transition more restrictive. Unlike Mogai, it's not a movement without goals. Transmedicalists consider themselves the arbiters of who is and isn't a trans person, a distinction that is easy to draw on paper, especially if you're willing to lie, but impossible to draw in real life. So when anti-Mogai types are confronted with the messy reality of gender, who does and doesn't count as a trans person can change at a moment's notice. Therefore, calling them just anti-Mogai feels incomplete. Sure, that's their jumping off point and that's what gets them a lot of attention, but what they really oppose is unashamed expressions of queerness. They will come down hard on any trans person they can depict as too brash or too open-minded or too legibly trans. Whether their target experiences gender dysphoria or seeks medical transition is actually entirely irrelevant. When I asked people to call me she, I made sure I didn't have facial hair. I made sure I shaved my face. I, I personally, in my heart of hearts, can't look at that and be like, that's a woman. My next guest knows that all too well. Though they weren't a part of the Mogai scene on Tumblr, in fact, they asked me what exactly it was, they've become the poster child for everything that is supposedly wrong with the trans community. YouTubers have targeted them for years with bad faith arguments about their gender expression and their ideas about not treating trans identity as a problem to be fixed. Because they have so much firsthand experience here, I thought they could offer a helpful perspective on how this trend began and where we can go from here. Hello. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for doing this. Um, would you mind introducing yourself and a little bit about what you do? Yeah, oh my gosh. My name is Myla Stewart. I use they, them pronouns. I don't know. I'm a YouTuber, TM. I'm expecting most of my audience will recognize you already, um, be it through the overlap Psych. in our audiences or just you being a fairly visible trans person on the internet. Um, That's one way to put it. <laughs> Um, can I ask you about how that came to be, how you kind of became such a visible, like, representative of the trans community this past decade? Yeah, I really don't like saying representative because I think the people who, like, find me online sometimes have, like, a vis visceral reaction to, like, thinking of me as their representative when, like, they don't think that I match up with their experiences. I've just kind of always been this, like, queer person online, um, but didn't really have a lot of viewership until um, I was in a video with Ash Ardell um, <laughs> when I was 15, when I was kind of, you know, also like <laughs> in the point of my life where I was on Tumblr and I was a teenager, like coming into my political views. So I thought that just like, like having opinions was like the most radical thing. So then I got well known for a couple of videos in 2016, one in which I poorly described implicit biases um, and called all white people racist. Um, and I think that's like how most people came to see me. Originally my videos were just responded to by, I don't know, like <laughs> some teenage boy with like, you know, the same amount of subscribers as me being like feminist bad. <sighs> I was like a nobody on YouTube before that happened. Yeah. And it just happened that like one person responded to me and then it just went on that, like that got recommended, like farther and farther to the right. Videos that are like very transphobic. Um, yeah. There's like still videos that are public on YouTube that are like telling me to kill myself. Oh, you're fucking And I'm like, kidding. we went from like, like, uh, I don't know, like a PG-13 kind of offensive, but like whatever video to like that. Why do you think people have taken you specifically as a representative of the whole community? Why do you think they, they use you as their person, you know? Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I wish it was easier to understand that perspective because I just, I really don't think that it's like a super logical thing. The people who are our representation, yeah. um, I think still have like a lot of pressure on them because there's so few of us, but I think it's like very strange. Um, the difference between celebrities or actors who are like going out there specifically because, you know, they're, uh, 
you know, seeking a very public career. And that was like very different from my experience as being a teenager who was making videos that would get viewed by, you know, a couple thousand, <laughs> you know, people. I get comments that are like, if you're a, a public figure um, who's trans and like you have, you have to represent the community and you have a responsibility to like put out a good image. Um, that feels like, kind of silly because you didn't yeah. ask to become a public figure. That kind of just happened, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's kind of like circular that like that kind of that upset. Like, people being mad at the fact that I'm <laughs> creating this representation is kind of what has given me representation or, like, given me a platform. I noticed that a lot of the people vocally, let's say, disavowing certain facets of the trans community, like people who are maybe gender nonconforming or non-binary, I noticed a lot of those people are themselves trans. Um, and there's this attempt to, like, distance themselves from the rest of the community um, what do you think they hope to gain from that? I think there's a, a pretty big distinction between the needs of trans people who are wanting to medically transition and the needs of people who, not that they don't want to medically transition, but that that isn't um, as much of a goal for them. It's kind of, you know, a historical pattern in the trans community that um, trans people who are wanting to medically transition have given in a lot to cis narratives of trans people in order to access transition um, that then like we haven't ever very vocally created narratives for ourselves. So many of the ideas that we have in the major media of what it means to be trans come out of um, this really old inaccurate narrative. We haven't ever really vocally challenged um, that narrative in psychology in a way that I think like really significantly changes the structure of how um, trans bodies and trans identities are perceived. Transipathologization is saying like being trans is not a mental illness. I obviously don't buy the narrative that I'm trans because I was like born in the wrong body or there's something wrong with my brain. Right. But when someone asks me like, you know, why are you a woman? I have no idea. I don't know how to even begin to answer that yeah, question. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know, I man. don't know either. <laughs> Like, yeah. I, I mean, I guess that's why I'm non-binary because I'm like, you know what? I don't fucking get it. So I'm just <laughs> going to say, like, I don't give a shit. But also, like, you know, I want a body that looks like this, this, and that. I think it's so silly when people come for, like, a 13-year-old calling themselves, like, star gender or whatever. It's like, yeah. that, that is a literal child. <laughs> and yeah. they're going to figure it out. <laughs> it's all good. Um, yeah. I just, I just yeah. feel like any risk that that could possibly pose is so so outweighed by calling those people out and mocking them that could be like an extremely like taxing experience but also like it can like make someone go back into the closet or like you know change how someone relates to the community that i'm just like really could we just be like having different conversations about this or like having it in a more like respectful conversational manner i don't know absolutely how do you think this is a big one how do you think we can build from there a community that is more accepting and more inclusive to everyone. <sighs> yeah, that's big. <laughs> um, I don't think I have the answer to that because I think we need more than just like one person's voice that we need like a collective community response to determine like what that alternative narrative to pathologization is. But I guess I can only say like what has been really revelatory to me is like just doing the research of figuring out like why is it that we have this narrative the psychology kind of recreates this uh divide that exists in, tr in trans community you know if we identify um like that institution as the cause of that rift then we can see like actually there's reason for us to come together in opposition to that mm -hmm. um and to like work for like access and care for like the entire community thanks again yeah. Take it easy. Have a rest of your day. Thanks, you too. See ya. Bye. This talk with Milo really helped me put things into perspective. Even if we've always been here, the foundation for the Western LGBT community has only really been laid in the past 50 years and the trans community especially is still forming. Openly trans people skew young, which has made the shape of trans space itself kind of adolescent. 
but thankfully this means all of us get a say in what it will grow into. We have a long way to go, and I don't think any of our current methods are really equipped for the fight ahead. Not the Mogai approach and certainly not the assimilationist one. We'll need perspectives from all walks of life, not just young people with internet access. For what it's worth, my take is that we should look to the queer people before us and take notes from their struggle instead of trying to invent a whole new approach from scratch. Maybe Mogai's single biggest mistake. I mean, generations of queer people have fought tooth and nail to be considered on their own terms, to be documented, to be remembered. Do we think we don't have to do the same thing? Are we really that arrogant? History doesn't just fall into place. It's not just an honest documentation of everything that happened. It has to be written, and we should be involved in that process. If we want a hand in writing our own history, it'll take a lot more than these insular communities uninterested in practical change. The new generation of openly LGBT people is the largest the world has ever seen and we have a lot of power we can harness. Personally, I'd like to see that power go into food programs, housing programs, clinics, event spaces. I mean, really, the possibilities are endless. These resources already exist in many cities, but more participation would definitely help. I think it would help us move past the nebulous goal of validation and onto some more practical solutions. It would also help us collectively log off a bit. And on that note, <sighs> I'm not here to knock the internet, right? Without it, I don't know where I would be. So many of us would be confused and isolated from our people. But I wish we would stop treating it like it's everything. Posts are just words, they're not action. And maybe they are the first step in today's fight for liberation, but they're not the only step or the most important one. I'm feeling a little stupid just sitting here. My point is, with the internet as impossibly vast as it is, Almost any post you make will eventually be forgotten. Any notion you have of making a change, making a mark, is hopeless if it's not grounded in action, in demands, in solidarity. So for everyone who considers themselves socially conscious, myself included, I have a question. If the internet were to just disappear tomorrow and never come back, what would you have to show for all your work? Who did you help? because you can name millions of new genders. You can imagine new and ideal worlds from the comfort of your apartment. And that's all fun and good. But when people forget, and they will, will it still matter?